zu dieser Frage Putin, der neue Hitler. Regarding this question, Putin, the new Hitler, what is that in Germany? Malicious, one might say, there is indeed a twisted form of dealing with the past taking place. Because if Putin is the new Hitler, then we are, so to speak, one to one. We had the original Hitler who invaded Russia, now they have their own Hitler. It somehow balances out, is supposed to emotionally balance out, so to speak. Hello everyone, and welcome back to Neutrality Studies, where today I have Dr. Leo Ensel as a guest. Dr. Ensel is a conflict researcher and intercultural trainer specializing in the post-Soviet space in Eastern Europe. Dr. Ensel is also a very diligent writer who has been regularly contributing to various media outlets for many years, for example to the Nachdenkzeiten where he published a very good essay in March titled Apathy and Shock Paralysis. Why do the fears of a war escalation remain silent and without consequence? That's what we want to talk about today. Dr. Ansel, welcome. I'm glad the conversation is happening because the essay you wrote addresses a question that has been on my mind for a long time. Why is it, in Germany and in Europe in general, I feel, that there is no fear that this war will become worse, bigger, and above all, nuclear? Why do we even hear many voices saying that one should not be afraid? Keep going. Send long-range missiles into Russia now. Where does this come from? Yes, that's the million-dollar question. I have to say, I've been dealing with this question not just since yesterday or the day before. I wrote a book about it exactly 40 years ago. Back then, it was about the question of why we had virtually no fear of nuclear armament. And the situation back then was eerily similar in some respects to today. At the time I was writing, there were medium-range missiles, cruise missiles, then nuclear-armed, on the horizon. The difference is that back then there was a peace movement, a very broad one. We don't have that today. And now I come to the answer to your question. And the answer is complex because it can't be summarized in one sentence or one argument. I would say there are current reasons for this. And there are reasons inherent in the nuclear situation itself. That means they would also apply in other situations. I'll start with the current situation. And to make this a bit clearer, I'll compare it to the peace movement of the 1980s, where I was a member and very involved. Today, we find ourselves in Germany in a situation where, since the 1990s, I don't know who said it back then, a politician, we are surrounded by friends. Quite the opposite of the situation during the first Cold War. Back then, Germany, or the divide that ran through the world, went through our country in the form of barbed wire. And minefields, but of course also through our capital. It was completely clear to us back then that if things were to explode, both German states would be the battleground of the superpowers, the USSR and the USA. And then, not a stone would be left standing here. There were 6,000 nuclear weapons stationed in West Germany alone. I can't tell you how many were stationed in the GDR at the time, but it certainly wasn't a small number. Most of them were intended to detonate on our terrain, by the way. So we would have been defended to death. And this awareness spread widely in the early 1980s and eventually led to hundreds of thousands of people actually taking to the streets. Today, at first glance, it seems as if we are no longer threatened. One could also say that the threat has shifted approximately a thousand to fifteen hundred kilometers further east. If it should actually come to the point, which is unfortunately not entirely out of the question, that our country is drawn into the Ukraine war through NATO, 
There are statements, for example, from Macron, who at least considered the idea of sending French soldiers to Ukraine a few months ago. There are loud demands from leading German politicians, I think of Mr. Kiesewetter and also a green politician, to extensively use Taurus missiles with which they can pulverize the Kremlin deep into Russia. This could have unforeseeable consequences for our country, but at the moment it's still practically the case, if I compare it to the first Cold War. The threat itself is 1,500 kilometers further away. And the fact that this wouldn't matter in a serious situation is not really present psychologically. That's one argument. There are several arguments. A second argument is that war has become something more abstract in public perception over the last few decades. It's also presented to us as if they were clinically clean joystick operations. Look at and compare the images you see of the fighters, soldiers on both sides of the front in Ukraine. And compare that with the images that fluttered from Vietnam into televisions around the world. Back then, reporters were on the ground and showed corresponding images of killing, murder, and dying at the front. Today, we see nothing of the sort. There is, so to speak, a cynical, all-party coalition of Russians, Ukrainians, and NATO, all of whom have an interest in us not seeing the killing and dying at the front. This, of course, creates the fiction that war is something clinically clean, which it is not. At the same time, the generation that experienced World War II is dying out, and also the generation that experienced the Cold War. And also the generation that experienced the Cold War. And the Cold War is in our bones, like in mine, for example. We're not getting any younger. This means that future generations won't know it firsthand or even secondhand and won't be as traumatized by it. This means they juggle the weights relatively easily, which also scares me. Third point, the young generation. If I compare it with the peace movement of the 1980s, we were all 40 years younger then. The young generation today is so focused on the climate issue that they can't see that the climate could be most sustainably destroyed with a limited nuclear strike. And that armament is already a massive climate killer, even in peacetime, let alone in wartime, which we are experiencing. The question of the possible destruction of the world through military means and the possible destruction of the world through so-called peaceful means are actually inseparably linked. Back in the peace movement of the 1980s, we had a term for this, which has tellingly fallen into oblivion. The term was Okopax. Ecology and peace belong together. Now we have this peculiar situation where there is a generational polarization, which could be somewhat simplistically summarized with the formula, climate for the young, peace for the old. Complete nonsense. It's even worse when you look at what happened in Germany with the Green Party, which originally emerged from the peace movement. But today, the green in the Green Party only refers to the color of the uniform. That's how it is. How do you explain that? You were there. You surely witnessed this split when suddenly the Greens no longer wanted anything to do with peace, or when, for some reason, something shifted and the Greens started to believe in this NATO game, that NATO and bombs are the way to peace. Yes, this is one of the most astonishing turns in German history since reunification, which also occupies me greatly and annoys me immensely. Because in the 1980s, it was indeed the case that the Greens, when they entered the Bundestag in 1983, were, so to speak, our mainstay, or more precisely, our play leg in Parliament. 
To answer your question, I think it was a gradual development. In retrospect, one is always wiser. And in retrospect, you can see a few turning points where the Greens actually developed into a bellicose party. To the belligerent party they are today, where even the pacifists, who once existed and were actually leading, are either dead, I'm especially thinking of the smartest politician the Greens ever had, possibly also Germany, Antje Vollmer, who passed away a year and a half ago. Whoever else is still there has been alienated, left voluntarily or voluntarily keeps quiet. In retrospect, I believe that the original sin of the Greens was the approval of NATO's illegal war of aggression against the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia in the spring of 1999. You may recall Joschka Fischer invoked Auschwitz at the time. He countered the peace movement slogan, Never Again War, with the slogan, Never Again Auschwitz. He didn't do it below that. And I think that was a very significant turning point. Gradually, a new generation also came to power within the Green Party. Look at the ages of those who are in power now, for example, our foreign minister. You can read on Wikipedia that she was taken to peace demonstrations by her parents at the age of two. So this apple has fallen very far from the tree by now. And for today's Greens, regarding the generational question, something very similar applies to what I just formulated a bit more generally. These are all people who had nothing to do with war anymore. Additionally, and this is my personal opinion, the Greens have an almost physiologically ingrained conviction, down to their very core, that they are on the morally right side. And when you are on the morally right side, almost anything is allowed. There is simply a lack of self-reflection on whether it is truly right that the whole world actually wants to be healed by our nature, to paraphrase Kaiser Wilhelm. So this incredible perceived moral arrogance also leads to the belief that one can now improve the world with military means. I still can't quite explain it to myself, because it has nothing to do with intelligence. It's not a question of intelligence, and I need to briefly describe something that happened to me, and I would like to hear your opinion on it. I had two conversations over the past six months, with two historians, one Swiss and one German. So top-notch historians, whom I admire, for their work and achievements. Very good historical thinkers at universities. His, also historische Denker an den Universitäten. Ich hatte mit beiden ein Gespräch über, über die I had a conversation with both of them about the course of the Ukraine war and explained my position, which actually doesn't differ. My position is that of John Mearsheimer, Jeffrey Sachs, Mr. Barth, and you, and so on, that this war absolutely needs to be de-escalated, that one must, if not excuse, at least understand the other side and that the security concerns of both sides must be considered. And in the end, after 50 minutes, the Swiss historian told me, Pascal, I have to stop talking to you now. I feel physically sick from the atrocity you're telling me. The second person, the German historian, we were together, we talked. At one point he said we absolutely must fire long-range missiles into Ukraine to send a signal to Putin. I then replied that we must not do that under any circumstances. Europe and NATO should not do that at all. As a Swiss, I'm not involved in that. That could draw us into a third world war. He said Putin would never do that. NATO is only defending. I said no. In 1999, NATO started attacking. He looked at me and said, what? Excuse me. Yes, that was an illegal war of aggression against Yugoslavia. And then he had something to drink in his hand, threw it away, yelled at me, and said, I won't listen to such nonsense. Remember Srebrenica. Never again, Srebrenica. The emotion in him became so strong. Of course, we had also been drinking alcohol. Maybe that played a part. 
but such a strong emotional reaction. And from both of these historians, I experienced extreme emotional reactions to my portrayal of what is happening. Can you explain psychologically why people get so absorbed? Both, by the way, mention Srebrenica, and Srebrenica was in 1995, and the attack was in 1999. But there's a link that people automatically make, which triggers something in them. Apparently, yes. I mean, I can't look into these two historians either. Let me put it the other way around. If they had stayed in a rational discourse, the appropriate counter-question from both historians would have been, please justify why this war was against international law. You would have had to justify it. And the justification would have been that according to international law, a country can only be militarily active in another country under two conditions. Either it has the permission of that country, the government of that country, or there is a mandate from the UN Security Council. Neither was present, so it was against international law. It can be justified quite simply and factually. Rational, and it's not an emotional matter. Yes. Well, I also know this from good acquaintances. Sometimes that's the nice thing. When you do everything in writing by email, you can see exactly at a certain point how people disengage, thus refusing a rational discourse. I'll illustrate this with a completely different example. I was in the Donbass 19 years ago. In Donetsk and Gorlovka, Ukrainian Horlivka, both cities in the rebel territory. In Artemovsk, also called Bakhmut, this place gained sad notoriety last year. Bakhmut meat grinder, Bakhmut's meat grinder. In Konstantinovka, which is about 30 kilometers west of Bakhmut and is currently still under Kiev's control, but already under Russian shelling. The background was that I reconstructed the war route of my grandfather, who led a military hospital there as a doctor, from November 1941 to summer 1942. And I wanted to talk to veterans, which I did, and since then I have known a German lecturer in Donetsk. And in 2014, there was this terrible incident in Odessa, on May 2nd, where so-called pro-Russian demonstrators were attacked by so-called pro-Ukrainian demonstrators in the trade union building. The trade union building was set on fire, people jumped out of the windows, approximately 50 people lost their lives. It has not been properly clarified to this day. And my good acquaintance in Donetsk said it was a genocide. And I said, that was not a genocide. What a genocide is, the Jews know and the Armenians know, I would call it a massacre. After that, she wanted to end contact with me. So that means I think when people, so strongly, here it is like this, it was at a time when Donetsk was already being shelled by the Kiev Central Power. The Donbass has been shelled for over 10.5 years. And there had already been 13,000 victims there when Russia officially invaded the war itself, which was hardly reported in the West. So people are sometimes so sensitive that they are actually no longer accessible to a rational discourse for a moment. Does this have something to do with the fact that this group of people from wherever, so intimately connects this worldview, or their own analysis of how the world works, and what is currently happening in the world with themselves, that if you question the analysis, you automatically affect them personally, and then experience an emotional reaction. There are people who can abstract that, who can separate an argument about how we perceive what is happening from the acceptance of the self by the other. Do you have that? Do you have any thoughts on this? I would say that is very human. And that applies to everyone, no matter what position you hold. I have to remind myself repeatedly to make an effort to be open to a rational discourse. This also means being open to the arguments of the opposing side. 
not taking them personally and continuing to listen to arguments. So I think, first of all, it is entirely human. And this is completely independent of whether one supports these militaristic measures that are being pushed by our government and almost 100% demanded by our press, or whether one is a so-called Putin sympathizer. It's simply human. A rational discourse always involves making an effort to look at the arguments and also observing oneself with a critical eye. Self-reflection can never hurt in a debate. I absolutely agree with you, but we do have a problem. Namely, that the discourse about the war is conducted in such a way that it makes certain positions impossible from the start. Terms like Putin apologist or Kremlin stooge are used as fighting words to prevent a certain interpretation or understanding of the war and to exclude it from the debate from the outset. That's right. Nowadays, when someone wants to discredit another, they say that person is pushing the Kremlin narrative. Exactly. First, we need to clarify what narratives and facts actually are. One should rely on facts. Narratives are always stories constructed around facts, usually in a way that suits one's own agenda. When someone argues that you are pushing the Kremlin narrative, it is based on a very primitive thesis. Everything the West says is true, and everything that comes from Moscow is a lie. In this logic, you must, excuse me for saying this, claim that 2 plus 2 is at least 7, if not 8, if Putin has said that 2 plus 2 is 4. That's the level of the debate. I was just about to make this argument. If Mr. Putin were to say that 2 plus 2 is 4, then tomorrow the entire German TV would have to say that 2 plus 2 is no longer 4. It never was 4, by the way. It was never true. It goes even further to the point where the accusation of serving a Kremlin narrative, or in English, what was the expression again? talking point, that it is a Putin talking point in English. That's not really the claim, it's a lie. So a talking point or a narrative can indeed be the admission that it's true, but we don't accept it, and it's no longer legitimate to bring this true fact into the discussion. And with that, you keep your mind and your own narrative hermetically clean. Yes. This inevitably leads to distancing oneself from reality sooner or later, and possibly taking risks that should better be avoided. For example, we are currently dealing with what I call a retrofit 2.0. Our chancellor announced, seemingly out of the blue, two months ago that in two years, cruise missiles will be stationed in Germany again, along with hypersonic missiles that are yet to be developed. This makes us a target for Russian first strikes, possibly in a war or crisis situation. Is this the same story as in the Western High Noon? Two sides, heavily armed, face off against each other. And in this logic which both sides have then entered, each must shoot first. This means we are dealing with a self-ignition mechanism. And with hypersonic missiles, there's the added factor that they no longer follow ballistic trajectories. This means they are controllable until the end and therefore practically no longer eliminable. So the other side is forced, whether it's Putin, the devil, Adolf Hitler, or St. Francis of Assisi sitting there, every person in this situation must press the button first. Back then, 40 years ago, in the peace movement, when there was a similar situation, we had the saying, Ramps for missiles are magnets for doom. You take these risks when you have a perspective that no longer targets the whole picture. If you allow me, I would like to return to the topic. Your initial question was, why do we accept these dangers so comparatively passively? And I mentioned at the beginning that there are two reasons. 
current reasons, and reasons inherent in the nuclear situation itself. If you permit, I would like to elaborate a bit on the second point because it is very important. Why do we have almost no fear of the greatest possible danger? That humans are capable of destroying this planet not just once but multiple times over? Everyone knows this. No one thinks it's good. But I have yet to see anyone who has broken down out of fear of this situation. Every dog that barks at you on the street causes more fear and terror than this information. This is a completely abstract piece of information. And this has something to do, and now I refer to a philosopher who back in the 1950s, about 70 years ago, put this into classic formulations. It has to do with the fact that this danger is simply too great. It exceeds our imagination. Gunther Anders once put it very nicely, he said, we can create the apocalypse. We cannot imagine it. We can no longer imagine what we can create and do. This means that as creators of destruction, we have godlike omnipotence. But as imaginers, we are dwarfs. Our capabilities diverge, the greater the technical means we have ever produced. Additionally, the danger is so immensely horrifying that, for entirely understandable reasons, one does not want to let it come close. It cannot be properly located anywhere. That means it is essentially everywhere and thus nowhere. We do not see atomic bombs themselves. And even if we did see them, we would see nothing at all because we can no longer discern from these things things, what they are capable of causing. Compare an atomic bomb to an antiquated knife. With the knife, you can clearly see what it can do. The atomic bomb looks comparatively harmless, but its effect is unimaginably large compared to its appearance. And the infernal aspect of this situation is that it greatly promotes denial. That means if we think it through, the greater the danger, the more unimaginable it is, the less we are rationally and especially emotionally able to respond to it. The less we do something about it and the more easily this danger can occur. The greater the danger, the more easily it can occur. That is the infernal logic. Two questions. Do you interpret this as an individual psychological or emotional problem or defect at the level of the individual, and that this idea can already be brought out, or the understanding of it? Or is it ingrained in our DNA that we cannot do this, that we are not capable of it? First question. Second question. Why was there fear during the Cold War? So, when I listen to my father's accounts, he was afraid. In the 60s, he was afraid of nuclear war, and Switzerland built bunkers for every household. You don't build masses of bunkers because you feel everything will be fine. There was real fear during the Cold War. And now, now it's gone. Even though we now have more of these, I mean, we have fewer nuclear bombs than back then, but the ones we have are much more powerful. Um, Yes, two very, very good questions. I'll try to address your first question. You asked if this is an individual psychological question? No, Gunther Anders, whom I refer to here because he was the first to articulate this in truly classic formulations, and because unfortunately he has since fallen into oblivion. I also see it as somewhat my task to reintroduce these thoughts into public discourse. We don't need to reinvent the wheel for the 125th time. This has all been thought through and articulated in classic formulations. It has just been forgotten. Gunther Anders coined the phrase the obsolescence of man. By this, he means that humans lag behind their own products. If you want to bring back rock from Mars, you actually do it much more practically with an unmanned probe. It can do all that wonderfully. If you want to send humans made of flesh and blood there, maybe it will happen at some point, then it is an absolutely highly complicated endeavor. Devices can do it much better, much faster.
So in this sense, one could exaggeratedly say, again a formulation by Gunther Anders, humans are the saboteurs of their own products. The products can actually do much better without humans. We are currently seeing this with the topic of artificial intelligence, where we don't even know where it will lead us. So, und jetzt versuche ich Ihre Frage im Detail zu beantworten. So, and now I will try to answer your question in detail. On one hand, you could say that we as humanity have maneuvered ourselves into a situation without a master plan underlying it. However, the fact that we can actually bring about our own end with the devices we have created has been clear since Hiroshima. At the same time, let me put it this way, we have great difficulty imagining what we can produce. You notice, I'm slightly qualifying the statement I made earlier, which was very exclusive. Günther Anders, who made this discrepancy the focal point of his philosophy, was of course also faced with exactly the question you just formulated. Is this chasm between creating and imagining insurmountable? Or is there at least some room for elasticity, so to speak? And he says he favors this thesis, meaning our feelings have a certain stretchability, you could almost say. For example, someone wants to convey a message to you knowing it will shock you. Then if they are somewhat sensitive, they might say something like, please brace yourself for something. It's best if you sit down. This means they are essentially appealing to you that something is coming that exceeds your normal everyday feelings. You prepare yourself for it, meaning you also adjust to the fact that something is coming. This means we already have the ability to extend our emotional capacity to a certain degree. And Anders would say that this is now our task in this time. If we don't want to hopelessly lag behind our products, we must, so to speak, train the elasticity of our feelings. That means, it's a task, we must perform feelings. I wrote a book on this exact topic 42 years ago, and I called it that we must learn the right kind of fear. Actually, one should have said, practice. That this can actually work to some extent, and thankfully we don't have to activate the adequate level of fear within us. We truly couldn't do that. What would be adequate to the threat would indeed render us powerless. It's enough if we can emotionally realize a small aspect and then we face the task. How can the fear we experience drive us to act and not lead us to completely succumb to powerlessness? Forty years ago, it was a bit easier. I recently spoke with a good acquaintance, and we agreed that the situation is very serious at the moment. And she asked me, what should I do now? A completely justified question. Forty years ago, I would have said, look at what peace groups exist in your city, check them out, and join the one where you feel most comfortable. We need to rebuild all of that now. Yes, those are very good points. The next issue we need to address is, where has the peace movement gone? But let's stay on this point for a moment, because the point about fear, you also beautifully wrote in your essay, courage to fear, meaning the courage to be allowed to be afraid again. Also a formulation by Gunther Anders, not by me. Everything has already been put into classic formulations. It also goes in that direction, and that was a question for me. Sweden and Finland have given up their neutrality, which brought Sweden through European politics for 200 years, and Finland through the Cold War. And with the whole logic, we will not be a threat to the other. That has been abandoned, and now both are frontline states in a NATO war, all connected again with this idea. No, deterrence. Deterrence works. It also goes in this direction. And also, the absence of what you said at the beginning, that we don't see the blood, we don't see the war. There was a time when war films were shown on German television, on ZDF and ARD, there were two or three every week, showing how terrible the war was. 
waren jede Woche zwei oder drei da, wie schlimm der Krieg war. Und die verblutenden Soldaten hat man gesehen, also respektive die, die gespielten und so weiter, oder? And the bleeding soldiers were seen, or rather the acted ones, and so on, right? Even the anti-war films, the real anti-war films, are Full Metal Jacket and Platoon and Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, I think, right? The beautiful film about the First World War, where you see the suffering of the soldiers, and then the catharsis of coming together and celebrating Christmas, and then the slaughter again. And all that is gone now. It's even forbidden. YouTube and Twitter, and so on, prohibit showing real images of bleeding children in Palestine, because that would shock the mind. We managed all this within a decade, because it used to be there. These war films were there. I don't know if you know, I had the opportunity to meet with Mikhail Gorbachev personally twice, at his foundation. During our first meeting he told me about the nuclear disarmament at the time, with 80% of the world's nuclear warheads being dismantled. It all started with Gorbachev, against the then still reluctant and highly suspicious West, essentially forcing disarmament in the short and medium range sector, exactly what is now back on the agenda. Hat damals Gorbatschow äh, diese Abrüstung dem Westen fast aufgezwungen durch eine Attacke von Diplomatie und von einseitigen Maßnahmen. Through an attack of diplomacy and unilateral measures, it was magnificent, a shining moment in history. And he told me that he succeeded because both he and Ronald Reagan knew what a nuclear war could cause. And regarding Ronald Reagan, I heard that for the first time there. I did a bit of research afterward. I don't know if it's true, but there's a story that Ronald Reagan, in a situation where the confrontation had become very tense in the fall of 1983, watched the film The Day After. It was a film that aired at the time about a nuclear strike. Das war ein Film, der damals lief, äh, über einen Atomschlag. Und das hätte, so die Geschichte, ein Umdenken. And that, according to the story, would have caused a change in his thinking. Yes, all of that is gone. But I almost would have said that it's completely normal for any ordinary war that everything is done to ensure that people imagine as little as possible about what is actually happening or could happen. That is our task, our unpleasant task to bring exactly that back into the discourse. And by doing so, you don't make yourself particularly popular, because these are not pleasant facts. Because you also have to get people out of their understandable state of shock or their unwillingness to engage with it. That is all understandable. We are discussing how to instill fear in people. We need to relearn fear. Yes, although, I think that's just one aspect. Fear doesn't actually drive one to act if there isn't some possibility seen somewhere. So I believe if we can't simultaneously build structures of civil disobedience and nonviolent resistance where people who have faced this danger for a moment and not just on a purely cognitive level but at least try to allow these feelings to some extent, have a way to turn this justified fear into action. If there are no possibilities for action alongside it, then the experienced fear will generally be unproductive, because it drives one into powerlessness and renewed bewilderment, and then one doesn't want to have anything to do with it anymore, and understandably buries their head in the sand. Yeah, yeah, this is the... Yes, yes. There is this saying that when you are afraid, or rather when you get a real shock because you are truly threatened, there are two instinctive options, fight or flight. And in this sense, fight is not meant as a one-on-one -on -one battle, but rather as fighting against what you are facing. So we need to find a way to inspire people to stand against this threat of mutual nuclear destruction. And that was the peace movement. The peace movement was the active fight against this danger. Yes, and... And that means addressing the rulers of one's own society. Not the others, but our own. Not Mr. Schultz in Germany, 
and Mr. Putin in Russia, but the other way around. We need to start stopping. In this context, it means not making ourselves completely defenseless and exposed overnight, but rather, in my opinion, it's about something entirely different. What I accuse the so-called collective West of in connection with the Ukraine war. And by that I mean our federal government, the EU, NATO, and the USA. It's the total refusal in terms of diplomacy. I wouldn't have been thrilled, but that Russia was supported with weapons when it invaded Ukraine to prevent Russia from capturing Kiev, and I think that was the goal, to install a regime change. The blueprint for this, after all, comes from the West. But fine, I could have lived with such arms deliveries if at the same time everything, absolutely everything, had been done to kickstart the diplomacy machine. The exact opposite happened. There was already an agreement between Ukraine and Russia, which was boycotted by the West. That means, when it is said here that you can't negotiate with Putin, I have to ask in return, how long is this war supposed to go on? How many soldiers, how many civilians are still supposed to fall by the wayside? And with soldiers, we also have to consider, aside from paramilitary groups that exist on both sides, I'm simplifying a bit here, on the Ukrainian side, Azov, and on the Russian side, Wagner, which at least no longer exist in this form, we are dealing with conscripted men fighting on both sides. Ordinary men who actually just want to return to their families and lead a normal everyday life again. How many more people do we want to sacrifice? Should Ukraine be defended to the point of destruction with cluster munitions, with uranium munitions that destroy its own land? And when you say you can't negotiate with the other side, you extend the war to the very bitter end. That means a task, actually the most normal thing in the world, would be for the population, whether you call it a peace movement, or for all I care, there are now also possibilities to vote for a certain party in elections, to demand from the leaders of their own country to use diplomacy, to use at least as much diplomacy in this war as weapons, at least the same. That would already be a very important demand that should come from the population. And in the sense of well-understood self-interest, we are already suffering from it in the form of inflation. Our economy is going down the drain because we have denied ourselves the cheap energy supply from Russia. We are shooting ourselves in the foot by sanctioning Russia. The Russian economy is booming. This means the war is not in our interest, and it is especially not in our interest to be drawn into this war. Those who demand, for example, that the Crimean bridge be attacked with Taurus missiles or engage in such games, or who demand that these missiles be used deep within Russian territory, are playing with our own security because they provoke counterattacks. General Kujat, with whom I have a good relationship, once put it in a somewhat old-fashioned way, saying these people are bad patriots. What are you doing to our country? <laughs> yes, I am. The analysis and the picture you're drawing are absolutely 100% understandable to me, and we share the same analysis of the problem of the situation. The insidious thing is this game, and maybe I really have to ask you there. And I also have, well, my grandmother was German, and her big brother died on the Eastern Front. So I have one in the SS. I also have Nazis in the family. And he died much younger, he was 26, and ended on the Eastern Front. So probably quite bad. I can't imagine it being pleasant. Are there still feelings of guilt in Germany? 
Because at the moment, the main argument, the number one argument, is that you can't negotiate with Mr. Putin because Mr. Putin is Hitler. He is Hitler, and you can't negotiate with him. And the extreme part is that this accusation, mainly, or most strongly, comes from Germany, that this man is Hitler. Is there still a lot of projection, historical guilt feelings, being projected outward, onto others? Two thoughts come to mind. Again, one more general and one more specific. I'll start with the more general one this time. The British Nobel Prize winning physicist Blackett once coined the following phrase in the 1950s or 60s. If a nation possesses an absolute weapon, then it is psychologically necessary to believe in an absolute enemy. Translated into a few more sentences, this means, if I possess a weapon that can turn hundreds of thousands, millions of innocent people into corpses in a very short time, then I can justify this to my conscience, if at all, only by declaring the other side to be absolutely evil. One could sharply say that the atomic bomb dictates to each of its owners the appropriate enemy. This means that if we have weapons of mass destruction, we are forced to construct an absolute enemy. That's the first point. The second is the rebirth of Hitler, which we see every time the West starts to instigate a new war. Putin is not the first new Hitler. In the late 1990s it was Milosevic, an illegal war of aggression. Then in 2003, it was Saddam Hussein, an illegal war of aggression. Now it's Putin. This means it's a pattern. They will always find a Hitler. They need one, because otherwise they cannot justify a war of aggression. The situation in Ukraine is more complicated, especially from the German perspective. And I would like to preface this by noting a significant difference between public opinion and published opinion. In a survey conducted by the polling institute INSA at the end of February, 61% of Germans said they feared that the Ukraine war could spill over into NATO territory. So, one cannot say that there is no awareness of the problem among the population. And according to the latest surveys, I believe 69% of Germans have expressed support for diplomacy in the Ukraine war. So a truly war-enthusiastic, war-hungry, sorry for the word, population looks different. I don't think we are dealing with a majority of people in Germany who now want to proceed against Russia with flying colors. Quite the opposite. Thankfully, there are people with unease, underlying fears, maybe not to the point of trembling with fear, but it's not really right for anyone. And the public opinion is very different. It is very much warmongering. And now to this question, Putin, the new Hitler, what is that in Germany? Maliciously, one could say that a twisted form of dealing with the past is indeed taking place. Because if Putin is the new Hitler, then we are, so to speak, one to one. We had the original Hitler who invaded Russia, now they have their own Hitler. This is supposed to somehow balance out emotionally. And there is another word that I find almost more treacherous. The war lasted a few months, it was maybe three or four months. That's when our Chancellor Schultz spoke of a war of annihilation that Russia would be waging against Ukraine. War of annihilation spoken. War of Annihilation was mentioned. This word, like the word turning point, which is equally ideological, naturally enters public discourse and is often used and quoted. War of Annihilation is what the Wehrmacht and SS committed between 1941 and 1944 on the territory of the former Soviet Union. Almost 27 million dead. That is a War of Annihilation. And that ties into Srebrenica. Srebrenica was a moment when a large group of people was annihilated. It's the same sentiment, the same feeling, 
this never again. I would say Srebrenica was a massacre. Yes, emotionally I feel it evokes the same feelings as the words War of Annihilation or Srebrenica, that now something is being done against an absolute evil that one has inflicted in the past. Yes, I also see these feelings that are triggered. We should not let ourselves be so overwhelmed by spontaneous feelings that we forget to think. Srebrenica was a massacre and thus a crime, and the largest massacre on European soil since the end of World War II. As for what happened in the prehistory of the Kosovo War, I'm not well informed. But there is some evidence that there were also manipulations by Western-oriented circles. I'm expressing myself very, very cautiously now. A war of extermination does not consist of a single massacre, but of countless massacres. What the SS did in a Ukrainian small town, in a Russian, and especially in a Belarusian village, is at least half of what happened in Srebrenica. You probably know Babi Yar. At the end of September 1941, the SS Special Commando 4A shot over 30,000 people within two days. Incidentally, with the active support of the German Order Police, and as far as I know, also with the active support of Ukrainian auxiliary troops. That was not the only massacre. Many more followed. The Holocaust began on the territory of the Soviet Union in the form of mass shootings of entire Jewish communities. The gas chambers came later because it was realized that these measures were unacceptable, specifically for the perpetrators. Himmler was afraid that these perpetrators would no longer be socially compatible afterward, and these poor perpetrators had to be relieved, so other methods were found. This is a war of extermination. And when we now speak of a war of extermination, every war is a crime. And I do not want to justify the invasion of Russian troops into Ukraine at all, even though I see that the West bears a lot of responsibility, to put it very cautiously. But the scale of the deaths does not justify the term war of extermination. This is ideological, and if one were to put it maliciously, in combination with the phrase, Putin is a second Hitler, a very cheap attempt at German historical disposal. I have a good friend who always tells me, Putin is like Hitler, and then I ask, yes, why? And then he says, yes, it's exactly the same narcissistic injury as a child. He is a psychoanalyst. And then I said, did Putin also kill six million Jews? Of course he did not. So in this logic, Putin is a Hitler minus the Holocaust. It reminds me a bit of that nice phrase, did you know that the Alps present a very sad sight if you imagine the mountains gone? That's Putin without the Holocaust. It's a... We will be dealing with this for a long time. So, also the processing of what is happening at the moment, psychologically with the people, socially, the political changes, and we haven't really managed to properly address the absence of the peace movement. We are now at one hour, so we need to wrap up slowly. I just want to say that hopefully we can rebuild that, and we are currently networking with each other. You can really notice that. Two years later, I feel we are at a better standpoint with each other, as we can talk about something similar to a Peace Corps again, with people exchanging ideas, even across borders. Dr. Ensel, for those who would like to follow your presentations and essays, where is the best place to do that? Where can they find you? Google the Nachdenkseiten and enter Leo Ensel in the search function. Or on Global Bridge, a Swiss platform, Christian Müller. Or on Free21, which is published by my good acquaintance Dirk Pohlmann. So you'll find plenty there. All right, I will link all of that. Dr. Ensel, we need to have another conversation sometime. This was highly interesting for me. Thank you very much for your time. Yes, gladly. Thank you too.
If you value our translations, please consider supporting us on Patreon. The link is in the description. Thank you very much.